Did you know? Not only was Super Mario Odyssey specifically made for the Switch, it was balanced to appeal to both core and casual gamers. The game's developers knew the Switch's portability would lead to some playing in short bursts while commuting to work or school. Because of this, the team decided to include many collectible moons that were easy to grab in short bursts. The team at Nintendo also wanted to make full use of the Switch's Joy-Cons during development. They thought the Joy-Cons were a good fit for a throwing gesture, and decided to have players throw something in the game. They settled on throwing Mario's hat, since it's already an iconic part of Mario's character. Nintendo were also working on a capture mechanic that let players take control of objects and creatures in the environment. However, they didn't have an intuitive way for the player to possess the objects around them. The team experimented with using Mario's cap to possess enemies, and the two mechanics were combined into one, which also helped define the character of Cappy. Interestingly, the capture mechanic was only in development for a few days before it was chosen to be a significant feature of the game. Nintendo purposely planned for the first possessable creature to be a frog. Since jumping is the core mechanic of the Mario franchise, the frog's jump would instantly show players how capturing objects can affect gameplay. Not only did the Switch affect how the game was designed, Odyssey impacted how the Switch itself was developed. Odyssey producer Yoshiaki Koizumi suggested in an interview with Metro that HD Rumble was added to the Switch so he could use it in Odyssey. The timing on this may seem strange, but Koizumi teased Odyssey in Edge magazine all the way back in 2014 while the Switch was still being worked on. The team challenged their assumptions about how to make the game accessible to younger players. They were unsure if younger players would need a fixed camera to keep things simple, like in the Galaxy games. This concern was put to rest after they realized young gamers were easily able to grasp the controllable camera in Minecraft. Removing the lives mechanic was also done to make the game more accessible. Although experienced players would rarely see a game over screen, inexperienced players could end up seeing it a lot. Removing lives also removed any discouragement felt from getting a game over, and new players wouldn't be deterred from exploring and investigating the game's sandbox. The sandbox nature of the game was a very important inclusion, and was one of the first ideas to be implemented. They chose a walled garden sandbox environment so they could experiment with the endless stream of ideas they had for the game. The choice of using a walled garden also influenced the direction of Odyssey, and brought it closer to the gameplay style of Mario 64 and Sunshine. That said, the team challenged themselves to include elements that might not fit in a conventional Mario game. They wanted to capture the unfamiliar and unsettling feeling of being in a new place for the first time. This is why the game has many elements that seem out of place at first, such as the T-Rex and the realistically proportioned humans in New Donk City. Nintendo also places realistic people in New Donk City to give players a sense of scale for the world, helping them understand how Mario moves and jumps in relation to real people. The presence of anatomically correct humans led to many fans asking whether Mario was actually human, as he's so different to the New Donkers. In an interview with Vice, the game's director, Kenta Motokura, confirmed that Mario is human, saying, quote, Mario is human. In the world, there are many different types of people, you know? Speaking of New Donk City, Pauline was originally going to be the city's princess. However, the role of princess didn't seem to fit a city environment, and she was made the mayor instead. This also gelled better with Pauline's musical persona. The lyrics to Odyssey's main theme, Jump Up Superstar, had to be completely rewritten when brought to the West. This was because the Japanese lyrics didn't have much of an impact when they were translated literally into English. The song's first English rewrite relied heavily on the listener's familiarity with Mario, and Nintendo of America requested more rewrites that would resonate with a casual audience. They also wanted the lyrics to be simple enough for non-English speakers to sing along to. This strategy paid off, and Jump Up Superstar broke into the top 25 music chart when it hit the North American iTunes store. It should be noted that this accomplishment is especially rare for video game music. Interestingly, Kate Higgins' performance for Jump Up Superstar was recorded before she acted out any of Pauline's lines for the game. The director didn't even talk to her about what Pauline should sound like until after the song was fully recorded. These aren't Odyssey's only audio secrets. The game's sound effects harmonize with the background music by changing pitch and tempo to match the music. This was done to a lesser extent in previous Mario games, but is most noticeable in Odyssey due to its abundant sound effects. When creating music for the Luncheon Kingdom, the game's musicians used actual cooking utensils as instruments. Some chops and clangs are the sounds of knives and ladles, helping cement the level's theme. 
Although Odyssey's levels all have a unique and consistent theme, they didn't start out this way. Each level was made with a different gimmick in mind, and an appropriate theme was added after. Basing the game's desert stage on Mexico came from director Kenta Motokura's trips to the country. Mexican culture left a strong impression on him and found its way into the level, as well as a costume for Mario. Other levels take more inspiration from media than the real world. The Wooded Kingdom has several similarities to the 1972 science fiction film Silent Running. The movie takes place in a giant greenhouse maintained by robots, with these robots greatly resembling the steam gardeners in Odyssey. The music from this area was also directed with a 60s theme in mind, loosely reminiscent of the era the film came out in. The Metro Kingdom is arguably the game's focal point. Interestingly, Odyssey might not be the first time New Donk City has appeared. In the instruction manual for Donkey Kong Land, it states that the game's Big Ape City is the location where the original Donkey Kong arcade game was set. It's been heavily implied by Nintendo that New Donk City is also the same place where the original Donkey Kong game took place, suggesting they are the same location. Other aspects of the game also reference media and world cultures. Jaxies are likely based on Komainu, which are Japanese lion statues that protect shrines and temples from evil. Old fables about Kumainu statues mention them suddenly coming to life, similar to Jaxies. The name Jaxi is a portmanteau of Jaguar and Taxi. However, their Japanese name is Raidon Bas, which is likely a mix of Raion, the Japanese for lion, and Raido, which means to ride. Another interesting fact is that the Jaxi's mane isn't a part of its body, it's actually a necklace. The Brutals seem to have a connection with Odyssey's setting. It's likely their relationship with the moon is based on the mythological moon rabbit, a creature inspired by markings on the moon which vaguely resemble a rabbit with a pestle and mortar. With the game's T-Rex design, Nintendo stayed close to the Tyrannosaurus Rex from the 1993 movie adaptation of Jurassic Park. Modern science depicts T-Rexes with feathers and more color, but these interpretations aren't as well known with the general public. This is likely why Nintendo went with a scientifically inaccurate depiction for the creature. The Sherm enemy might be named after the American M4 Sherman tank, which was frequently used during World War II. The Sherm seems to be connected to Odyssey's unusually high age rating for a Mario game. Odyssey is the first core Mario title to receive a B age rating by Sero in Japan and an Everyone 10 Plus rating by the ESRB in America. All previous core Mario titles were rated A for all ages in Japan and E for everyone in the States. The ESRB's own notes state, quote, During one boss encounter, players can capture a cartoony tank and fire cannonballs at a mechanical boss. This seems to point the blame at the Sherms. The game has many hidden secrets and unused ideas. The original texture for Odyssey's world map actually featured Isle Delfino from Mario Sunshine. Although the island was removed in the final game, it seems the developers forgot to remove it from the Odyssey Globe's roughness and normal texture maps. As a result, Isle Delfino can still be seen slightly at certain angles. The game was also planned to have references to other Nintendo franchises. Odyssey's code refers to a Link hat and a Link suit costume set which are labeled as, quote, a hat from a far off land, and, quote, this outfit from another land comes complete with back accessories, sadly non-removable. The data additionally references a Santa costume, a zombie costume, and an 8-bit Mario hat. Many of the concepts for hats were originally drawn on Goombas, which also showed the Santa hat among others. Speaking of costumes, Odyssey's Super Mario 64 costume doesn't actually use the same model as Mario 64. The model is altered and contains roughly 200 more polygons. This is mostly due to it being cut in half and mirrored. Since the original Nintendo 64 model was slightly asymmetrical in its use of polygons, there were a lot more polygons around the seam where the model was cut and mirrored. Odyssey also contains a modified version of the small Mario sprite from the original Super Mario Bros. The sprite went unused as Mario is never small in the final game, but the effort put into it could imply that a small Mario was planned to be included at some point. The game's internal project name is Red Star, continuing a theme of Mario titles being named after red objects. Super Mario 3D Land was codenamed Red Pepper, Super Mario 3D World was Red Carpet, and Super Mario Run was Red Bull. In the Japanese game and early builds of the English version, the binding band was named The Wedding Ring. 
This was likely changed in the Western release to avoid any religious connotation. There's also an interesting tidbit surrounding how the game tracks the player's progress. Although the Odyssey will count to 999 power moons, there are actually much more than this in the game. Odyssey has 880 moons listed as missions, the rest of which need to be purchased with coins at shops. The game will actually track 99 moons from each shop in the game's power moon list, and only the first moon purchased at each shop counts as a mission. This means there's an additional 98 moons at each shop. There are 13 shops in the game, which multiplies to 1,274 non-mission moons. Adding 1,274 to 880 brings the total to 2,154 moons, which can be tracked in the game. Did you know? Luigi's iconic green design was the result of technical limitations. Developers wanted Luigi's appearance to contrast Mario's red color scheme. This was necessary to make the duo easily distinguishable in the multiplayer of Mario Brothers for the arcade. Unfortunately, Nintendo's hardware was only capable of displaying a limited number of colors at a time, which made giving Luigi a custom palette almost impossible. Since it was already in use, developers took the Shell Creeper's color palette and applied it to Luigi. Although this limitation defined Luigi the character's first video game appearance displayed him in monochrome. Luigi actually debuted in Mario Bros. Game & Watch, which came out four months before the arcade game. However, this isn't the only instance of Luigi being absent of a green color scheme. In 1986, Japan received a feature-length Super Mario anime titled Super Mario Bros. The Great Mission to Rescue Princess Peach. Unusually, Luigi is seen wearing blue overalls and a yellow sweater throughout the film. This was even referenced in one of Luigi's alternate color palettes for Super Smash Bros. for Wii U and 3DS. There are multiple accounts of how Luigi got his name. While the name is a pun of the Japanese word Ruigi, which means similar, another account suggests suggests that the name was inspired by a pizza parlor. This supposed pizza parlor was located near the office of Minoru Arakawa, the former president of Nintendo of America, and was called Mario and Luigi's. Nintendo has never publicly acknowledged this story, however, and there is very little evidence of a Mario and Luigi's pizza ever existing near Arakawa's office. One defining trait of Luigi is that he's often portrayed as a coward. Ironically, Luigi actually means renowned fighter or famous warrior in Italian. After the first Super Mario Bros. game, Luigi's character started to be fleshed out. The American version of Super Mario Bros. 2 was a reskinned alteration of a Japanese exclusive called Doki Doki Panic. When the game was localized, Luigi took the place of the character Mama, inheriting her large jumps and low friction. These traits would become defining characteristics that set Luigi apart from his brother. However, Luigi first exhibited these abilities in the Japanese version of Super Mario Bros. 2, known as the Lost Levels in the West. It's unclear whether Luigi unique properties influenced the design of Doki Doki Panic, or if his similarities to Mama were a fruitful coincidence. However, it is worth noting that Doki Doki Panic originally started as a Mario-style prototype that explored vertical platforming. Oddly, Luigi had three different sets of sprites across the different releases of Super Mario World. The original release had Luigi as a palette swap of Mario. In Super Mario All-Stars plus Super Mario World, Luigi was given his own set of sprites and animations that defined his character. And when Super Mario World was ported to the Game Boy Advance, Luigi was given a new set of sprites more in line with the other Mario Advance games. In 1999, Mario creator Shigeru Miyamoto spoke about Mario and Luigi becoming a little too cutesy. He particularly thought that their use of the peace sign-like V for victory gesture was childish. To remedy this, he promised a more grown-up Mario title for the GameCube. Despite his protest against the V gesture, the pose actually did make it into Luigi's Mansion. Luigi's Mansion was originally intended for release on the Nintendo 64, but the project would have taken a very different form. Neither Luigi nor the mansion were planned to appear in the game initially. The game's outline had Mario as the star, and several locations from houses to apartment complexes were considered. One of the more interesting ideas for settings was a dollhouse. As time went on, the project was shifted to the GameCube, and it was around this time Nintendo gave the concept a fresh start and gave Luigi the starring role. Eventually, the team hit upon the idea of using a European-style mansion, which could also be found in older buildings in the United States. However, before this final setting was decided upon, the team had considered using a Japanese-style building or even a ninja mansion. A possible relic of the game's N64 origins can be found in its data, a star collection sound effect from Super Mario 64. 
Luigi's Mansion also contains the elusive Totaka's Song. Totaka's Song is a 19-note melody by Nintendo sound designer Kazumi Totaka, and it's often hidden in his games. While Totaka's Song can be heard in the control subscreen of Luigi's Mansion, it was originally going to appear during the encounter with Melody Pianissima as well. There are files in the game's code that have her play a jaunty rendition of the theme. Luigi's Mansion was actually tested to run in 3D, but this version was scrapped. Ex-Nintendo president Satoru Iwata spoke about their tests, saying, Nintendo GameCube could display 3D images if you attached a special LCD, but that special liquid crystal display was really expensive back then. We couldn't have done it without selling it for a price far above that of the Nintendo GameCube itself. We already had a game for it, though, Luigi's Mansion. The game's relationship with 3D would continue. While developing the Nintendo 3DS, developers used Luigi's Mansion to test the system's hardware. These tests essentially began the production of Luigi's Mansion Dark Moon. After making Punch-Out for the Wii and putting together a failed pitch for a 3DS Metroid game, Next Level Games took the helm of Dark Moon's development. They received help from Nintendo Software Planning and Development, and were guided by Shigeru Miyamoto himself. Miyamoto stated that his motivation to make a new Luigi's Mansion game was simply that he loved the original. Early in production, Next Level Games had outlined all the bosses they wanted in Dark Moon. Miyamoto apparently threw out every design and told the team to start over from scratch, and that they should make something that could only work in Luigi's Mansion. The game has some inspirations that might not seem obvious at first glance. Throughout Dark Moon, Luigi saves several Toad assistants by finding them and escorting them to safety. These moments weren't actually inspired by the opening of The Legend of Zelda A Link to the Past, where Link needed to help Zelda escape from the Hyrule Castle dungeon. Dark Moon also contains several hidden messages. In the mission A Timely Entrance, the comm booter will say 0110010011011111. This is binary and simply translates to Boo. Taking the first letter of the name of the game's mansions, Gloomy Manor, Haunted Towers, Old Clockworks, Secret Mine, and Treacherous Mansions will spell out the word Ghost. This is also true of the bonus missions and possessors, and was even left intact internationally. The letters will make out the words Geist in the German version and Spook in the Dutch version. However, this is only true of the Dutch possessors and bonus missions. And in the French version, the first letter of each bonus mission spells out Luigi. Did you know? Paper Mario's artistic direction of having 2D paper objects in 3D space came from the game's developers wanting to have a change of scenery. This was in case players were getting tired of CG graphics. With Nintendo's Hiroyasu Sasano elaborating, even Mario was made with polygons in Mario 64, so we thought it would be nice to offer something different and came upon making Mario's world with a pastel touch. However, making an entire 2D world like a Super Nintendo game and releasing it for the N64 would be pointless. So we gave the game field depth and made it 3D. Other interesting choices were made during the game's development. The character of Tubba Blubber and several elements from Paper Mario's third chapter are based on a Norwegian fairy tale from the 1800s called The Giant Who Had No Heart in His Body. The antagonist of the tale was a giant who captured a princess and kept his heart outside his body, and could only be killed if his heart was destroyed. In the fairy tale, the giant's heart is within a church that contains a well, and at the bottom of the well is a nest with a duck egg inside, with the egg containing the giant's heart. This is why in Paper Mario, Tubba Blubber's heart is in what appears to be a nest at the bottom of a well. Since the game's release, fans have turned Paper Mario inside out looking for secrets. One such secret was discovered 15 years after the game's release by Strider 7X. In the Smash Attack minigame room, 10 Luigis can be found underneath the scene. The game stores objects and characters off screen when they aren't in use, making it likely that the minigame once featured Luigi. It's speculated that the goal of Smash Attack may have originally been to find 10 Luigis instead of 10 Peach Faces. 
the game has another out-of-bounds secret. If the player uses what's known as the Log Skip, a glitch that allows players to reach the south of Toad Town early, they can encounter some interesting unused dialogue. In the Japanese game, if players use this skip and then talk to Babolb, it'll say, you shouldn't be able to get here yet. If you did, it's a bug, so please get in contact. Other residents have similar dialogue, urging the player to contact Nintendo and report the glitch. If players perform the glitch and talk to the Babolb in the English version, it will simply softlock the game. Other games have also referenced Paper Mario. Mario Party 5, 6, and 7 each contain references to the original Paper Mario. Mario Party 5 includes the Star Spirits as party hosts. Mario Party 6 has a Wacker pop up out of some snow on the Snowflake Lake board. And Mario Party 7's Pyramid Park board has a Bowser Sphinx based on the boss Toot and Koopa. Paper Mario The Thousand Year Door has its fair share of secrets as well. As you may know, the x naught Fortress has a changing room that makes Mario and his current partner transform into 8-bit sprites. What you may not know, however, is that Peach was supposed to be able to use the changing room as well. Within the game's files is an unused 8-bit sprite of Peach, likely from a cut scenario in the game. One interesting fact about The Thousand Year Door is that it was the first Paper Mario game translated in North America. Paper Mario on the N64 was translated into English in Japan, which led to a more basic localization. Translating Thousand Year Door at the Nintendo Treehouse allowed localizers to do more with the game's writing. That said, some early localization choices were revised in the final release. In an early 2004 demo version of the game, the x noughts are called Boomergangers when tattled. No other text related to x noughts is present, but this suggests the entire organization was going to be called the Boomer Gang, or at the very least, this title was once considered. Thousand Year Door also has secrets that can't normally be seen. In Rogueport, there's graffiti covering the walls of an alley. Some of the graffiti is off-screen during gameplay, such as the tag GameCube with a V, which is likely a mistranslation of GameCube. This happens often in Japanese games, as the Japanese language doesn't have a strong V sound. V sounds similar to a B, so a B is often used in its place. When writing Japanese words in English, translators are often uncertain whether a B or V should be used in a word, leading to mistakes like this. This isn't the only off-screen secret. In the battle scenes for the Thousand Year Door, there are many theatre-based objects that can't be seen during normal play scattered around the stage. This includes lights, a radio, ladders, buckets, a broom, and other small details. Super Paper Mario has a wealth of secrets too. The game references the Wii Shop Channel, in the only instance of the Wii Shop Channel being referenced in a Mario game. The channel's loading icon briefly appears in Fractale's eye during a cutscene where he searches his databanks. The game has other subtle easter eggs. The grandfather clock in Merle's mansion pulls the time from the Wii system clock, in most cases showing the accurate time of day. Since the clock has no in-game purpose and is visually similar to other decorations, this is likely to be overlooked during gameplay. The game's characters also have some interesting references surrounding them. In the German version of the game, Francis is named Conrad. This is in reference to both Conrad, a popular German computer store, as well as a reference to Conrad Zuse, the German inventor of the world's first programmable computer. His Japanese name also has a tech-based pun. In Japan, he's called Chameleon, a combination of chameleon and polygon. Super Paper Mario was also referenced in other games. Several bumper stickers can be unlocked in Metroid Prime 3 Corruption and in Metroid Prime Trilogy in the bonus gallery. The stickers can be seen on Samus's gunship and are accessible when save files for specific games are stored on the Wii. One sticker is the head of Paper Mario, which becomes available when players have a save file of Super Paper Mario on their Wii. Super Paper Mario has a few secrets that can't normally be seen as well. The Korean version of the game has several unused areas in its data, each with out-of-place objects and characters in them. Some areas feature some very strange-looking humanoid cats. The origin of these cats and why they're exclusive to the Korean release, which came out two years after the Japanese version, is currently unknown. Another piece of unused content for Super Paper Mario can be found on the game's disc as well as early screenshots. The game's data contains an unused title screen showing a pixel who resembles a ladder in the place of Thoru. 
this pixel was never included in the final game. Interestingly, there's also an unused ladder climbing animation for Mario in the game's data, showing a side-on perspective. Normally in the game, all climbing animations are shown from behind. Although it's arguably the smallest Paper Mario game, Sticker Star also has its share of interesting secrets. Within the game's files, the folder containing Kirsty's dialogue file is named Navi. This is a reference to the character of the same name from Ocarina of Time, as Kirsty and Navi have similar roles as companions in their respective games. Speaking of Kirsty, in the final battle in Sticker Star, Kirsty warns Mario not to sell her at a shop. This comes across as a joke, as normally it's not possible to sell her at a shop anyway. However, by hacking the game so that the Kirsty sticker can be taken to a shop, it's revealed she was given the price of a mere 15 coins. Another secret about Sticker Star is that it originally had partners in the game other than Kirsty. These additional partners were apparently removed because they took the focus away from the sticker-based gameplay. Early footage, and at least one screenshot, show a Chain Chomp partner fighting by Mario's side, and helping him overcome environmental obstacles. Players would have to wait four years to get their hands on a new Paper Mario game, but some fans were able to play Paper Mario Color Splash before the game even released. Color Splash was available for pre-purchase on the Wii U eShop two weeks before the game's release, but some fans discovered that the pre-purchase download hadn't been locked. Nintendo of America had accidentally made the full game available two whole weeks before launch. Nintendo pulled the preload option from the North American eShop, but those who had already pre-installed the game were able to play it early. Color Splash has become somewhat known for its excellent localization and wealth of secrets and easter eggs. Just as the Mario Party games referenced Paper Mario, Color Splash returns the favor with multiple nods. The quintuplet of toads named the Five Fun Guys get their name from Mario Party 8. The troop's name is a nod to Mario and Toad's Mario Party 8 team named Fungi Fun Guys, which was confirmed by Nintendo themselves. The quintuplets host two minigames in Color Splash, one of which is named Toad and Go Seek. This title is a nod to Mario Party 9, which has a minigame of the same name also based on Hide and Go Seek. Did you know? Super Mario Party has several secrets within its minigames. The stakes in the Sizzling Stakes minigame are actually meant to be dice. Although the English release refers to the stakes as cubes, the title of the minigame in the original Japanese release translates as Cook the Dice Steak. This also extends to the Korean version, where the minigame is called Roll the Dice Steak. The minigame Making Faces is called Fukuwari Crane in the Japanese game, which references the game's origins. Fukuwari is a Japanese tabletop game similar to pin the tail on the donkey, and players attempt to put facial features on top of a blank face. A more comical secret can be seen if the player enters the minigame Rhythm and Bruise as Monty Mole. In the game, Monty Mole will have a panicked expression and sweat profusely as he bashes the other moles with a hammer. Super Mario Party also has several noteworthy regional differences, such as Birdo's gender being very different across various regions of the world. The game's North American English release refers to Birdo using feminine pronouns, whereas the British English English release uses masculine pronouns for the character. Other versions of the game, such as the Chinese and French releases, use more neutral pronouns when referring to Birdo. Another difference in the British English version of the game is that the toadies are referred to as Magicoopers. This difference could be a simple localization error, as the Japanese name for the toadies, Kokameku, can mean Little Magicooper in Japanese. Interestingly, this same mistake was made in Mario Party 5, where capsules containing a toady were implied to have Magicoopers inside. It could also also be an error stemming from the similarity of the two enemies. The franchise has other regional oddities. Mario Party 2 was the first Mario game to be translated in both Italian and Spanish, but strangely, Mario Party 3 didn't receive an Italian translation at all. Mario Party 4 was the first game in the series to be released in North America before Japan. It was also the first to feature pre-rendered cutscenes, and is so far the only game in the series to have them. The recurring character Woody goes by the name Kinokyo in Japanese. 
Japanese, playing off the Japanese word ki, meaning both tree and Pinocchio. His evil counterpart, Warukyo, has the same name in both Japanese and English. Warukyo uses the same naming scheme as Wario and Waluigi, with Warui meaning bad in Japanese. However, because Woody's name was changed from Pinocchio, this play on words is all but lost in the West. Only the second Mario Party game saw release on the Nintendo Virtual Console service, both on the Wii and on the Wii U. It's believed the reason behind skipping Mario Party 1 is due to the several minigames that involve spinning the control stick as fast as possible. Many players used the palms of their hands to get the best results, and over 1,000 people complained of blisters and other related injuries, to which Nintendo found themselves in a class action lawsuit. Although Mario Party has been handled by several developers over the years, it's been largely handled by the same people. The series was developed by Hudson Soft from its first entry right up until Mario Party 8. After Mario Party 8's release, key members of Hudson left the company to work for ND Cube, who went on to make Wii Party and later Wii Party U, both of which resemble the Mario Party games. In January 2011, it was announced Hudson would be fully acquired by Konami that upcoming April and later dissolved into the company in March 2012. Ever since Mario Party 9, the series has been in the hands of ND Cube, a wholly owned subsidiary of Nintendo. Among the other familiar employees, former Hudson president Hidetoshi Endo is also the president of ND Cube, and has had either a producing or supervising role on every Mario Party to date. Similarly, developer Cap Production had a close relationship with Hudson and helped co develop every Mario Party under their name, a tradition that has continued with ND Cube. Though most of their work is uncredited, the dates and genres chronicled on their website match up with every Mario Party release. In an Iwata Asks interview about the development of Wii Party, former Nintendo president Satoru Iwata was curious as to how the team was able to put out a new Mario Party game at such a brisk pace, with a new title being released almost annually since the first game on Nintendo 64. The team had said their secret was new people joining the team with every new title, who would bring a bunch of new ideas for minigames with them. The team would come up with many different concepts that didn't make it into one game, choosing the ones appropriate for the time and stocking others away for future games. When it comes to creating a minigame, ideas come from all staff members. These ideas can originate from something as simple as a drawing or a single sentence. The planners then take those ideas and will either expand on them or merge several together to create a game. Mario Party veteran Suichiro Nishia said that when coming up with ideas, he takes a lot of inspiration from his daily life. Producer Atsushi Ikeda said the team has literally hundreds of ideas and that Mario Mario Party had just the right kind of structure for making one game after the other. Even so, team members worried about falling into a rut with the series due to its near-annual releases. To try and avoid this, they decided to change things up where possible, such as different playable characters and different sets of rules. At one point, they even thought about abandoning the dice block, but they didn't want to tamper with the basic formula that made Mario Party accessible. Mario Party has its fair share of regional changes. We've mentioned in previous episodes how in the first game, Luigi and Wario have altered voice clips depending on the region. In international releases, Wario says what many English-speaking fans perceived as, "No, oh, I missed, but this dialogue may in fact not be English. The line uttered may be a single line of German, so I missed, which can roughly translate to, ah, oh, crap. This line was not recorded by Mario actor Charles Martinet, but rather by former Nintendo of Europe employee Thomas Spindler. Spindler had been responsible for the German translation of several Nintendo 64 games, like Super Mario 64 and Star Fox. At the time, Nintendo occasionally used their international staff for voices in games, and according to Spindler, Nintendo envisioned Wario as a German character. The voices were originally recorded for the Japanese version of Mario Kart 64, but several found their way into the first three Mario parties, as well as Mario Kart Super Circuit on Game Boy Advance. On the matter, Spindler said, Wario speaks German. He says, so I missed. The recording was done in a studio of the former Nintendo head office in Kyoto, under the direction of Mr. Takashi Tazuka. The concept behind Wario was that of a German character, and those responsible for the voiceovers at Nintendo back then intended him to speak German. As the Mario franchise continued to grow and evolve, there were several aesthetic changes made to the Mario Party series to better fit the current Mario universe. Mario Party 4 was among the first games in the franchise to show Princess Peach with her current 
current look, as well as the very first for Princess Daisy's current design. During the days of the N64, Daisy had a darker skin tone and hair color, with Mario Party 4 solidifying her current design from then onwards. The game also had an earlier placeholder box art featuring the character models from Mario Party 3, before the new art direction was introduced for the upcoming console generation. The Koopa Kid character was an original element that was removed as the series went on. They first debuted as henchmen of Bowser, referred to as Mini Bowsers in PAL regions. In North America for Mario Party 1 through 3, they went under the name Baby Bowser, which is Bowser's own title in games like Yoshi's Island where he's seen as an infant. In Japanese, the kids were known as Koopa-sama no Bunshin, which can be translated as Master Koopa's Kid, referring to Bowser as Koopa for his Japanese name. Some games in the series had the Koopa kids refer to Bowser as their father, and Bowser even refers to one of them as his son in Mario Party 7. Things got even more confusing after Bowser's canonical son, Bowser Jr., was introduced to the Mario series starting with Mario Sunshine. It seems that even official Nintendo sources got confused at the time, as the American instruction manual for Mario Party 5 refers to the Koopa Kid as Bowser Jr. in one instance. Jr. eventually made his way into the series with Mario Party DS, and the Koopa Kids were slowly phased out, with 7 being their last appearance. In Mario Party The Top 100, Jr. replaces the two Koopa Kids in the final battle minigame from Mario Party 4. They only make a very small cameo in the game, showing up on box art of previous Mario Parties in the game's collection feature. During the release window for Mario Party The Top 100, Nintendo seemingly referenced the internet meme, Luigi wins by doing absolutely nothing, an event where a human-controlled Luigi faces off against three CPU players set on easy. Though not guaranteed to always work, there have been several instances of Luigi winning the game without even moving as the computer players fight with each other. The meme has extended to other games where Luigi is playable, such as Mario Kart and Smash Brothers. In a video posted on Nintendo Europe's Twitter showcasing the Bumper Ball minigame, Luigi was the last one standing by the end without even moving, with the Twitter post saying, yes, it still works. Another nod to Nintendo's past can be found in Mario Party Star Rush. One of the title's minigames is called Dodge Fuzzy Get Dizzy. This is a reference to the title of level 1-7 of Super Mario World 2 Yoshi's Island Touch Fuzzy Get Dizzy. Another secret in Mario Party 6 references Japanese culture. In the game's Snowflake Lake level, small rabbit-like creatures made of snow with red eyes and leaves for ears can be seen in the background. These reference a tradition in Japan where rabbits would be crafted from snow, using nandina berries for eyes and camellia leaves for ears. This practice was even documented in an Isoda Korusai painting from the late 1700. More recently, these rabbits have been produced using shaved ice or even ice cream as a cold treat. Did you know? In Super Mario 64, when Mario falls from a high enough distance, he'll take fall damage. However, if he lands on a snowy surface, the snow will absorb the impact and Mario will be stuck in the snow for a few seconds before getting out. There is an error where this same cushioning effect and animation are triggered when Mario falls onto frozen ponds from a great height. Another mistake in Mario 64 can be seen when Mario performs his trip kick move. During the animation, one of the buttons on his overalls simply disappears. After the player gets all 120 power stars, they gain access to the roof of Peach's castle, where they will run into Yoshi. Yoshi mentions how it's been so long since he's seen Mario, but his dialogue starts off with a spelling error. Yoshi says, Mario, it that really you? Where it should have been an is. There's been a number of times where a minor slip up can end up halting the player's progress or soft locking the game. Super Mario Bros. 3 has several instances of being unable to finish a level if certain things are done in a specific order. One instance of pure misfortune can happen in World 5. When an end spade card spawns in the overworld map and a hammer bro happens to walk over it, the two will combine and move across the map indefinitely. This ends up soft locking the game and all the player can do is reset. After defeating Mario 2's final boss, Wart, a door will open that leads to the end of the game. Beating Wart disables the level scrolling and if the player chooses to play as Luigi for this level, they can perform 
perform a glitch that renders the game unbeatable. This glitch was showcased by a YouTube user who recorded the event on tape in the early 90s. If Luigi jumps high enough, he'll be able to reach the room's ceiling. If he defeats Wart off screen, Luigi will be trapped on the ceiling and won't be able to get back down due to scrolling being disabled. Another case of soft locking is found in a unique version of Super Mario Bros. In 1986, Hudson Soft released a port of the game titled Super Mario Bros. Special, which released for the Sharp X1 and PC88 line of Japanese computers. This version has several unique features and a few changes to level design. Mario Bros. Special omits the original game's warp zones, though it seems like the idea was tampered with at some point. Jumping over the pipe near the end of World 1-2 leads to the level's bonus room, with an additional pipe leading to the end of the level. However, World 4-2's corresponding area features a singular warp pipe like the original. This pipe leads to nowhere, and if the player enters the pipe, they'll be stuck in there until the timer runs out. Super Mario Bros. The Lost Levels is known to be punishingly difficult, and has some intentional traps for players. However, some of the game's traps appear to be oversights. In World 3-1, there's an underground bonus level. Its exit is cut off by blocks which can only be broken with a power-up. There's a hidden mushroom in this area, but if the player gets hit by the neighboring piranha plant, they will be stuck. Some of the earliest mistakes in Mario games can be found in the title's instruction manuals, like with the booklet for Super Mario Bros. 2. Some versions of the manual switched the names for Birdo and Ostro around, but this was likely due to the error being present in the game's credits. This mistake reappeared in the Super Mario All-Stars version of Mario 2, but was fixed for the Super Mario Advance release on Game Boy Advance. Another error in Mario 2's credits is the spelling of the enemy Claw Grip, which was spelled Claw Glip. This spelling was present in the original game, All-Stars, and the Japanese version of Mario Advance. This may be linked to the Japanese game, as the sounds for L and R in the Japanese language overlap. Mario 2's manual also states that when the player enters subspace, they might be able to obtain a heart to extend their life meter. The heart being referenced is an item only found in the game's original Japanese template, Doki Doki Panic. In Mario 2, mushrooms increase the life meter, which funnily enough was mentioned on the page right beside the mistake. The screenshot used for Fanto was also taken from the original Doki Doki Panic instead of Mario 2, where Fanto's sprite is always smiling in-game. Instruction manuals around this time were also subject to odd translation choices, sometimes foregoing localization altogether. The manual for Super Mario Land transliterates the Japanese names of the game's enemies, including those derivative from the original Mario Brothers. The Goombo enemy, for instance, is called Chibibo, a portmanteau of Chibi and the Japanese name for Goomba, Koribo. Princess Daisy's name on page 13 of the original booklet is written out as Daisy Princess, though all other mentions of her in the manual write it out as Princess Daisy. It's likely a carryover of the Japanese styling of her name, where the name comes before the title, being Daisy Hime. The version of Mario Land released on Virtual Console is also the original version of the game, as opposed to the 1.1 version, which fixed a few glitches along with other minor revisions. What's odd about this choice is that most games released on the service use the latest revision of the game in question. The Virtual Console release of Donkey Kong on Game Boy has a minor flub of its own. The game's description on the eShop says it came out in June of 1981, despite it being released in 1994. The eShop date falls more in line with the original arcade Donkey Kong's release, but even then, the arcade game actually came out in July, not June. What makes this mistake even more glaring is that fans commonly refer to the Game Boy game as Donkey Kong 94, referencing the year it came out. In Super Mario Land 2, Mario actually has two different sets of sprites. One sprite set is used for darker levels, while the alternate set is used for every other setting, save for the Space Zone area. Mario's back-facing sprite had a few changes made to it before the game was released, though these changes weren't carried over to the alternate set. However, the back sprite used in the normal levels is the one used for darker set pieces, and as a result, the sprite can actually be seen through. It's harder to notice on the original Game Boy hardware, but is more evident on things like the Game Boy Color, and the mistake also applies to several other sprites in the game. In Super Mario World, the Koopalings Iggy and Lemmy share the exact same hairstyle, though in earlier depictions of the characters, like in Mario 3, their hairstyles are more distinct, with Iggy's hair tufts facing forward. Iggy's original hairstyle does exist in the game's data, but for one reason or another, went unused, though it does show up properly in the game's credit sequence.
Mistakes have often extended into Mario's RPG adventures. In Super Mario RPG, there's a visual error that can occur if the player lets Croco bring Mallow's HP down to zero during their second battle. Croco has a knack for stealing items from the player's active party, but after Mallow's defeat, Croco will only try to steal items from Mallow. Not only this, but Mallow will stand upright as if he's been revived, but he's still unable to fight. Paper Mario The Thousand Year Door has a few visual errors of its own. For example, throughout the game, the character Koops is inconsistently depicted with either three or four fingers on each of his hands. Another visual mistake relates to Luigi. Luigi's cap is made up of two separate textures, one for the cap and another for the L emblem, which is stored separately. This was done to prevent the L from being mirrored whenever Luigi's model had to turn around, but despite the effort, there's one instance where Luigi and the emblem aren't aligned. In the opening cutscene where Luigi goes to the mailbox, the emblem gets flipped for a brief moment before going back to normal. Another mishap in the game seems to be a basic logic error. When the player defeats Grodus at the Palace of Shadow, the sequence that follows will give the player the option to attack him, though at the risk of Princess as Peach's life. If they choose not to attack, Grodus will be furious the player dared to defy him. If they choose to attack, Grodus will tell them to stop talking. It seems the dialogue for these choices was reversed, but really, neither choice affects progression at all. There's been a number of books tied to the Mario franchise that spread a few falsehoods about the series. In 2015, Dark Horse Comics released the Super Mario Encyclopedia, an official guide covering the first 30 years of the franchise, with the English release coming out in 2000. 2018. This release had been met with some controversy for a few inaccuracies, including typos and false information. For example, it states that the first unmodified release of Super Mario Bros. 2 outside Japan was in 2014 on the Wii U's Virtual Console, when it actually first released seven years earlier on the Wii Virtual Console. It also claims the PAL block debuted in Super Mario Bros., when they actually debuted in the arcade game Mario Bros., without the Super. The book also misspells the name of the Wiggler enemy as Wriggler multiple times, which can be seen on pages 71 and 86. In Super Mario World, an oddity occurs with the Wiggler enemy. If the player dies above a Wiggler, on their way to the bottom of the screen, they'll still make contact with the Wiggler and even score points for doing so. At the end of the level Donut Plains 2, though unable to be seen through normal means, there's a buzzy beetle hidden inside the wall near the warp pipe. Due to the level's slow auto-scrolling, the player can't see it, and even if it could be seen, it would just end up falling through the floor. Speaking of buzzy beetles, they, along with Koopa shells, are the center of a glitch that's quite easy to pull off. If the player puts the shell on one of the enemies in front of a steep slope and tries to kick it up the slope, it will instead go right through the slope's wall. Did you know? Wario games have been subject to a lot of regional changes, notably with the WarioWare line of games. WarioWare Smooth Moves has a different title for each region it was released in, with the Japanese version even having its own unique title theme. Smooth Moves also has the player make poses with the Wii Remote called Forms that prepare the player for certain styles of micro games. Interestingly, nearly all 19 of these forms were altered to better suit international audiences. Many made references to Japanese culture, so these forms were localized with some clever workarounds. An example being the Japanese Tengu form being changed to an elephant form internationally, as both are known for their long noses. One form which depicted an important figure in Japanese history, Prince Shotoku, was changed to a janitor. The janitor's description mirrored Shotoku's, balancing the earth and the heavens with his baton, but instead balancing order and filth with his mop. Several micro games were also changed. A micro game based on Star Fox features Rob the Robot with the Famicom Beam Gun in the Japanese game, and with the NES Zapper in the West, coupled with Rob's appropriate color scheme for the regions. A micro game from WarioWare Twisted has roots in the Chinese story Journey to the West. The micro game was known as Slapjack internationally, and referred to the story of Jack and the Beanstalk instead. A driver's ed game has players drive on the right side of the road in Japan and on the left side in North America.
Wario Land Shake It also had a regional difference. It was called Wario Land the Shake Dimension in PAL regions, and simply Wario Land Shake in Japan and Wario Land Shaking in South Korea. The idea for Wario Land Shake It came about from Nintendo producer Takahiro Harada, who had a desire to revive the Wario Land series. Harada had recently played a Gomon platformer for the Nintendo DS, and enjoyed it so much he looked up the game's producer Etsunobu Ibitsu, who recently left Konami to found his own studio, Good Feel. Ibitsu wanted the studio to collaborate with Nintendo, and Harada claims the timing could not have been better. When the two decided on making a Wario game, Ibitsu initially thought of making a western-style shooter, being a genre he was playing a lot of at the time. Harada instead suggested they make a platformer, with that style being what the two knew best. The game's director, Madoka Yomauchi, proposed the game's hand-drawn style, a style the team was initially worried about doing. After seeing it in action with the rough line drawings, however, they agreed that the style had a great feel that couldn't be replicated with 3D polygons. Their goal was to make the ultimate 2D game, as it was something that had hadn't been achieved before. The animation was provided by Production IG, known for their work on anime such as Ghost in the Shell and Fooly Cooly. They previously worked with Nintendo on the FMV cutscenes for Fire Emblem, Path of Radiance, and Radiant Dawn, and later provided animation for Kid Icarus Uprising's Thanatos Rising shorts. Since everything was hand-drawn and no backgrounds were repeated, even a small change in level design meant a lot of work had to be redone. For Shake It, design director Taranori Tsukawaki wanted to show off more of a macho side to Wario, as opposed to his usual crass and rude qualities. This came about after he played the earlier Wario Land games, and got the impression he was actually quite manly. Tsukawaki said, He's so uncool that he ends up being extremely cool. Depending on the game, he can be coarse, farting and doing stuff like that, but I didn't want to show that side of him. As much as possible, I wanted to show a macho Wario, one who is masculine and tough. He asked the animators to truly emphasize the direction they were going for with this side of Wario. Some women who worked on the game initially complained about Wario, more specifically his nose, but by the end of development found him pretty cool. Though the game didn't sell very well, Good Feel would later go on to develop more Nintendo games, such as Kirby's Epic Yarn and Yoshi's Woolly World. Certain sound effects from Shake It can be heard in these games as well. Wario's victory theme from Smash Bros. Brawl was later remixed for Shake It's first level, Stone Carving City. Since Brawl and Shake It were released within four months of each other, it may have been an international easter egg for Wario's upcoming appearance post Smash. Wario has crossed over with several other series in rather strange ways. The Game Boy title, Wario Blast, featuring Bomberman is a reskinned Western exclusive version of the Japan only Bomberman GB. With the exception of Wario's presence, the game remains relatively unchanged from its Bomberman roots. The original game was released in Japan in August 1994, and made its way to North America in November that year, and in PAL regions in 1995. When Bomberman GB2 released in the West in 1998, three years removed from its original Japan release, it simply went under the name Bomberman GB as to not confuse gamers. Bomberman GB3 released in Japan in 1996, but didn't make its way to the West in any form. Though Wario Blast has never been referenced in later games, Wario has frequently been associated with bombs in later appearances, similar to how Mario Bros. 2 introduced defining traits of playable characters despite being a reskin of Doki Doki Panic. But bombs, which also debuted in Mario 2, are commonly paired up with Wario in the Mario Party and tennis games, and the Mario 64 DS game, Bomb Squad, is tied to Wario. In Mario Kart Double Dash, Wario's special item is the Bomb, and the logo for the WarioWare series features the Wario Bomb. Keeping in line with Wario clashing with other series, the recurring Wario Land character, Mad Science Dean, first appeared in the Japanese exclusive Game Boy game, Keru no Tama Nikane Wanaru, referred to as For Whom the Frog Bell Tolls in English, before making his Western debut in Wario Land 3. For Whom the Frog Bell Tolls was developed by Nintendo's R&D 1 team, the same group who created the Wario franchise. Science Dean later showed up in Dr. Mario 64 and Wario Land 4. The former game's roster is made up almost entirely of Wario characters, and the latter's guidebook officially states the connection between the Wario series and For 
Whom the Frog Bell Tolls. A remixed version of the Frog Bell Tolls main theme also appears as an unlockable record in WarioWare DIY. Wario is also said to have something he cares about even more than money, a pet. In Wario Land 2, he has a pet chicken simply named Hen. Did you know? Making a turn-based strategy game wasn't the first idea director Davide Soliani and his team landed on for Mario Plus Rabbids. The team brainstormed 13 ideas for the project early on, with a focus on emulating the fun of Mario Kart. Soliani told Nintendo UK, You won't believe me, but one of our references as a team was Mario Kart. We said, How cool would combat be if it was like Mario Kart but without the kart? On foot. Another big inspiration for the game was the slapstick 2D turn-based strategy series Worms. And as the project began to take shape, the team were inspired by other strategy games such as the XCOM series. Ubisoft got the opportunity to pitch their Mario Plus Rabbids concept to Nintendo thanks to their existing relationship. According to Mario creator Shigeru Miyamoto, the possibility of Ubisoft handling a Mario game started with the launch of Just Dance Wii in Japan. This version of Just Dance was made specifically for Japan and was a remixed version of Just Dance 2 with direct input from Nintendo. The game featured a track called Just Mario, which had Mario dancing on screen. This track was also later repackaged as downloadable content for Just Dance 3. Even though their relationship with Nintendo was already strong, this direct collaboration gave Ubisoft the chance to work more closely with Nintendo. Although this opened up the possibility of Ubisoft working on a Mario title, Ubisoft had already tried making a Mario game back in 2010, a year before the release of Just Dance Wii. This title was also a Mario and Rabbids crossover. It would have been an adventure game where the Rabbids invade the Mushroom Kingdom and would have featured self aware humor. Only concept art of the game seems to have been made, which was intended to be part of a presentation with Nintendo to greenlight a full game. However, this presentation never happened. It's rumored that the project may have been shut down by Nintendo when they learned of its existence. A few years later, several Ubisoft members spoke with Miyamoto at E3 2014. The group discussed the possibility of working on another collaboration, and Miyamoto told them he'd be happy to review any ideas Ubisoft put forward. This opened the doors for Davide Soliani and his team to work on a pitch involving Mario. Soliani and company had little over three weeks to prepare their pitch for Nintendo. Once it was decided the game should be a turn-based Mario and Rabbids crossover, the team discussed how big of a pitch they could make in just a few weeks. Soliani wanted to forego showing design documents and PowerPoint presentations at the pitch, deciding to go the extra mile and create a playable demo for Nintendo. The team spent countless hours authentically recreating the Mario and Luigi character models for the demo. They were recreated so well that even Miyamoto was shocked, and asked Ubisoft how they acquired the models, as Nintendo hadn't sent them any assets. Soliani believes this ultimately convinced Nintendo of Ubisoft's passion for the game. Although the pitch went well, Miyamoto had some small concerns. Soliani told Nintendo UK, Miyamoto told me, I'm impressed, but please don't make a platform game out of this. There is Mario jumping in our game, but it's a team jump. It's different. And he loved that. That was one of the first rules, to find new ideas. After the project was greenlit, it was Ubisoft's turn to be concerned. Soliani and his team concluded that firearms were a necessary inclusion for a tactics game. This could pose a problem and clash with the family-friendly image of Mario. Ubisoft knew the only way Nintendo would let Mario hold a gun was if the gun was unrealistic and cartoonish. Soliani said, We used a lot of disproportion to create our weapons. We didn't want them to look real, but at the same time we wanted the player to understand the function by just seeing the visual. When designing these unconventional weapons, the team looked at other works of fiction with distorted weapons. One source of inspiration was 1997's sci-fi hit The Fifth Element, which had a wide variety of bizarre weaponry. The team showed their near-final designs to Nintendo in person. Nintendo appreciated their efforts and gave their blessing to let Mario characters use the guns. The team also had weekly conference calls and sent daily updates to Nintendo to make sure they were on the right track. Through late 2016 and early 2017, several details and images of the game were leaked online. Despite all the excitement for Mario Plus Rabbids within Ubisoft, the game's early leaks turned out to be very discouraging for Soliani and his team. The leaked art assets and title for the game were an easy target for wary fans, who questioned how Rabbids could possibly fit into the Mushroom Kingdom. Soliani said, speaking about the leaks, We were aiming to do a big surprise at E3, and unluckily, that was not the case. Of course, it was quite a bad backlash for the entire team. Discouraging. Quite hard on the team morale. Soliani asked his co-workers whether they thought the game would be well received, and questioned if the past three years of development were well spent. One of the people Soliani asked was one of his development idols, Grant Kirkhope, who is the composer for Mario Plus Rabbids and a veteran of the industry. 
Funnily enough, when Kirk Hope was brought in to work on Battle Kingdom, he had no idea it was a Mario game. This was because it was titled Rabbids Battle Kingdom at the time, presumably to hide Mario's inclusion and minimize leaks. Kirk Hope told GamesIndustry.biz, They took me into the studio and into this back room. It was all big security, no one could get in. I sat down and DeVita turned on the TV and Mario was there. I thought they'd just been playing a Mario game. And then he started to move Mario, and I was like, what are you doing? And DeVita said, this is the game. It's a Mario game. It struck me. How on earth was I gonna write music for Mario after Koji Kondo, who is the greatest games composer in the world? I thought this is impossible. I can't possibly write music for this game. I'm just not good enough. There's another interesting anecdote about the game's music. One of the game's bosses has three acts of music in the style of classical opera, then heavy metal, and rap. Because vocals for the tracks hadn't been recorded yet, Kirk Hope needed to sing all three segments himself while he worked as a placeholder. A copy of these placeholder recordings are allegedly still in the Ubisoft offices. Kirk Hope said, Let's just say that I'm not the greatest singer in the world. I'm sure Davida has all the recordings tucked away somewhere for future blackmail. 